Hi, my name is Dennis Weeks. Uh, here's my submission, uh, Galatians 6, 11 through 18. A little bit of context, this is directed towards a high school group, uh, which also contains uh, adults in that group as well. So, uh, we'll begin. So for some of us, we loved our pre-college years. Um, I admit I had mixed feelings about those years. Um, I was that stereotypical goody two-shoe individual who the teachers complimented and they usually enjoyed having me in their class. And I was also a little old school in my way of thinking. Um, I would help people carry their books or since I was a band geek, I would help carry their musical instruments all over the place. And I love doing the fine arts, being involved in choir and uh, theater and symphonic band, jazz band, and even the marching band. Uh, but what always drove me nuts was I felt like that with all the good things that I had done for individuals and even for the way I treated teachers and how I was good to them, I always felt like I never got anything back for my good deeds. Um, and in particular, being the, the nice goody two-shoe guy, I was also that guy that uh, always asked out the girl but never got a yes and just got the let's stay friends uh, kind of speech. Um, and I always wanted a girlfriend and I always wanted to be recognized by my peers as uh, being dependable and being the leadership type of individual, uh, but it never happened in the way I, I wanted it to, never in the way I envisioned it. And I was pretty clueless. Uh, about life, about girls, um, just about everything at that age. Of course, during that time, you and I, uh, during high school, we think we know everything. Um, and it's not until we get older that we realize maybe maybe we could have used a little more help. Um, now, now I'm married with three kids, still clueless about uh, girls from time to time. You can ask my wife. Um, <laughs> and, but why is it that during those formative years, why is it that I felt like nothing I actually did mattered? Why, why is that? Well, so when I transitioned from high school into college, I went to a Big Ten school. I went to Michigan State University. Um, and I decided to go to this out-of-state school. I was from Georgia, and I wanted to go out of state. I wanted to be independent. And my hope was that I would reinvent who Dennis Weeks was. And, and some of you may even have a similar goal, hoping that school will be a fresh start for you. But you got to be careful with that. Now, I wanted to be the guy that could have fun and still get the girl. Uh, that, that's who I was at, at as a man at, at that time. And after about a month of being in school, I, find, I found myself trying out bits and pieces of the party life, wondering if this type of fun would help me feel valuable. Having that type of excitement would make me seem more like the kind of individual people would want to be around. Um, and late one night, um, I found myself on my dorm room floor and I found myself feeling empty and yearning for something deeper in my life. Uh, trying to be good left me feeling empty and then trying to be the fun guy left me in a dreadfully miserable place. And on my shelf I noticed something while I was sitting there feeling broken. I, I noticed my Bible there on my shelf, it was a little black, thin line NIV Bible that my mom had given me for Christmas. And uh, so I reached for it and I grabbed it right there on the floor and I opened it up. And I'll be honest, I didn't know what I was opening this up to. I didn't care. I just knew I needed to be in my scripture. I needed to be in God's word at that time. And I didn't care what page I turned to. I just knew I needed it. Um, and then I opened up the Psalms. That's where I was. And then I began to, to read. And to be honest, at that time, I was, so, I was feeling so desperate, I didn't even care what I was reading. All I knew was that I needed to be reading it. And then it happened. I began to pray from a broken spirit. And I began to ask the Lord to help me grow. Help me grow closer to Him. I, I asked the Lord to help surround me with individuals that would help me to be a better man of God, to be a better uh, Christian, to be somebody that, that showed that I loved him and helped me to give my life to the Lord 
and to give my purposes for his purposes. Now, it was about a week later after I said this prayer that a church named South Church uh, reached out to me on campus and they came to visit me in my dorm. Um, at first I kind of ignored them and, and ignored their, their, their uh, approach to me. And yet I found myself, I kept on bumping into them all over the time on campus. Michigan State's a campus of about 50 to 60,000 people, huge campus, and I kept on bumping into them all the time. And it wasn't, it wasn't intentional on their part. It, it, I think it was God putting us together. Um, and eventually, what happened was I would visit them, and I got involved in their college ministry. Um, and someone came alongside and discipled me, and I would learn what a life to live for Jesus looked like, not to mention that it was from that ministry, that college ministry, that God would bless me with my amazing wife. And that was God answering my prayer. Now, in the end, um, this ministry and everything that God had orchestrated and put together there, uh, it taught me that living for the sake of my own personal benefit, you know, whether that was to be good or to get the recognition of others, to be the fun guy to get the girl, uh, to live for benefiting myself was empty. And no matter how I did it, whether being good or by trying to be the fun guy, it would mean nothing if Jesus was not in my life, if he did not take the place where he needed to be. There is no value in living for the world, but only when living in Christ there's no value in living for the world unless we are living for Christ. So this concept of the, no value in living for the world but only when living in Christ was not lost on the early church. In fact, uh, just in the present, present age, they struggled with it all the time. Uh, with that, I would like us to pull out our scriptures, pull, pull out your Bibles, and I want you to open up to Galatians 6, 11-18. We have spare Bibles if you need them. Um, I would encourage you, if you're having trouble finding them, look to your neighbor. They can help you find it. Uh, they have no problem helping you find it. All right. So I'll be reading through this. Uh, if you would please uh, follow with me. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. But may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them, and upon the Israel of God. For now on, let no one cause trouble for me, but bear in my body the brand marks of Jesus. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. Now, this text is not only Paul trying to get the undivided attention of his audience, but he is trying to put some finality to an argument that he has been dealing with for some time. And this is the concept of uncircumcision. Verse 11 states, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. You see, Paul didn't always write his own letters. Um, he usually had someone else to actually write on his behalf as he spoke the letters aloud. However, in this case, Paul is making an exception for his usual practice. His objective may be to get the attention of his readers. It may uh, be because he wants his audience to understand how serious he is, that he's adding his personal touch. And uh, it may be because he wants his audience to understand um, this and so to bring some focus to it. Um, some academics even wonder if it's just because Paul struggled with uh, with his bad eyesight. Uh, 
I personally believe uh, that this is a case where Paul is getting the attention, bringing focus to, to the topic, and that since it's written by his hand, uh, it's, it's bringing a certain uh, sense of uh, authority that he's trying to bring to it as him being um, an apostle. So either way, but we understand that it does draw our attention and we take it seriously. So what we will see in the next verses is that Paul is going to be contrasting two very uh, different types of people. First, he will be addressing the Jews that are trying to get the Gentiles to be circumcised, and the second, himself, as it relates to the work of Christ on the cross. These particular two uh, contrasts. Now, I need to bring a little more context in here because some of you may not understand the importance of this idea of, of circumcision. Um, so, uh, though this idea of circumcision may be odd uh, to us today, it's kind of just something that um, if you're in Europe, you don't always do it all the time. Here in the U.S., it's pretty common, but for the most part, it's, it's not a requirement for, for most individuals. Uh, it's still very much relevant to uh, people that practice the Jewish faith, but for the most part, it's up to individuals whether or not they, they want to be circumcised. Um, in this context, however, uh, this concept of circumcision dealt with the fact that for the first time ever, there was an open movement occurring where the gospel was being preached to Gentiles. And up to this point, mostly Jews were the ones uh, that were coming to know Jesus. So when these outsiders, these Gentiles, uh, came to proclaim a saving faith in Jesus Christ, the question began to be asked from the Jews. When a Gentile a non-Jew proclaims to be a Christian, should they become circumcised? Because the Jews are. And if uh, Jesus Christ shared the gospel with the Jews, and the Jews were circumcised, and and uh, the Jews felt that they were saved, or they were uh, uh, in the Lord's covenant because of the circumcision, uh, would it make sense to also make Gentiles like Jews, and to follow along with this tradition, uh, to them more than just a tradition, uh, but something that pointed to um, the old law, um, the, the, uh, to, to the same covenant that God made with Abraham, circumcision. So basically, what, what the question comes down to is, Jews felt circumcision represented salvation, or God's guiding hand over them. And if we were to summarize this question in, in our own context, we would be saying, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? Um, and now we already know the answer. We already know that, uh, as I brought it before, what we're going to be getting to the fact is that there is no value in living for the world or, or living for traditions that are of a worldly, fleshly nature. Uh, but only when we're living in Christ and relying on Christ can there be any value in anything. Of, especially of, of, of eternal consequence. Um, so this is happening in the background, and Paul is battling against the idea that you have to be circumcised, because Christ ultimately is all that matters. And we finally come here to the end of the book, where he is calling out these false teachers that are saying they need circumcision. They're teaching a false doctrine that we need some type of work. This is the false teaching, that we need some type of work in addition to faith in Christ to make salvation happen. Now we need to remember salvation is, is faith in the works of Christ alone. Nothing additional. That's the power of Christ. Now Paul is trying to make clear that it is faith alone in Jesus and nothing that mankind can add to it. All right, so as as I said, Paul is trying to provide distinct statements in this portion of the text. Now first we're going to come back to the text, verses 12 through 13. Those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised, simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For those who are circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. Now this is dealing with those false teachers. 
verses 12 through 13. Paul is trying to point out that the motivations, the reason behind the teachings of these false teachers, these teachers act as though uh, their value in the living, in living for the world is the only place where we can get value. They're, they're saying that there's value in living for the world when there's when we know for sure that there's only value in living in Christ. And, and let me explain that a little more. Um, within these verses, we see that these false teachers are self-centric. There's a self-propelling motivation in the way that they are teaching, and that everything they teach regarding circumcision is bonked or, or is declared false because they actually don't even care about the teaching itself except for uh, the self-centeredness or what they believe they gain from just saying the words. So I'm going to walk through a couple examples. Uh, in verse 12, they just, well, what we see here is that they desire to make a good showing. Um, in other words, what they're saying is they are doing this to please someone, someone else, someone that is not the Lord. Um, and in particular, it would be other false teachers, um, and particular the uh, those Jews uh, that that are holding to these traditions of these false teachers. Now, another one is uh, is uh, is that um, those who desire to make a good showing in the flesh try to compel you to be circumcised simply so that they will not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. So, so, so not only is it that they are doing this for the benefit uh, to please somebody else for their own sakes, but they're not even doing this to please that person in the end. Uh, they're doing it to save their own neck. They're doing it to save themselves pain and wrath from earthly forces. Um, as it says, so they will avoid the persecution of the cross. In other words, these false teachers claim to be believers in Christ, yet in this time period to say that you believed in Christ without appearing like a Jew, circumcision, it would earn you to be treated poorly and even poorly by the local communities um, that, that did not understand truly who Jesus Christ was or how it transformed them as individuals. And so it would cause individuals that proclaimed only to be in Christ, they would receive persecution from individuals that believed that you needed circumcision or ill treatment. So these false teachers, in essence, are acting like the the mediators of compromise. Um, and they are trying to save their own neck to say, well, I agree with you on this, but I agree with you on this as well. So we're going to mesh these two ideas, which are completely, um, do they're like water and oil. They do not work with each other at all. And we're going we're, we're gonna to make this whole idea of faith and circumcision work together, that you have to have both for salvation, which is false. In verse 13, um, we come to the point where they say, uh, For those who am circumcised do not even keep the law themselves, but they desire to have you circumcised so that they may boast in your flesh. So they want something to brag about, to make themselves look good before these other teachers. Are we starting to see the pattern here? They're doing this to please somebody, somebody else for their own sake. They used it to lift themselves up. It is like, it's, it's, it's very similar to what we see in the church. Churches that overemphasize the idea of when we go out and evangelize, we get somebody to say a prayer and then we check them off as coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. But then there's no follow-up. There's no discipleship. There's no relationship. There's no building within the body. Um, I, would, I would compare this to that. It's the idea of saying, hey, I got somebody to say a prayer. I got 10 people today uh, to, to pray such a prayer, and boy, I just felt like Paul discipling to everybody. And another person would say, well, I got two people to pray this prayer, um, but, and, 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 and I feel great, but, but here's what it comes down to, though. 
if that's how you evangelize, essentially what you're saying is, hey, I got somebody to pray a prayer, but I'm going to leave them to the wolves of the world to eat them up and spit them out. Evangelism without discipleship is evangelism in the shallowest form. And we need to remember that these were shallow, false teachers. They wanted this, not for the sake of the glory of the Lord, but for the sake of their own glory. That is why they boasted in themselves, in these numbers. And finally, these individuals had no genuine belief. They had no genuine belief. They could really care less about what they were actually teaching and how it corresponded to uh, Abraham's covenant with the Lord. Uh, the, the 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 reading tells us that they did not even know the law, that they did not, excuse me, they did not follow the law and therefore did not, uh, in, in their actions, act as though they knew the law. And yet they're still teaching it. Was there any genuine belief in it? No. So these teachers were false by the truest sense of what a false teacher could be. So, after Paul rips into these false teachers and who they are, he tries to give the Galatians an example of what a good teacher looks like and what a good teacher would teach them about circumcision and what the motivation would be coming from a good teacher. And in particular, a good teacher would teach them how Christ changes the world around you and, and how he would change you and how he uses and so Paul uses himself as an example, and he contrasts this. So we need to remember where, where we're coming from in verses 12 through 13. These are individuals that found their value in living for the world, living for the flesh, living for themselves. Now Paul is going to give us an example of where real value is, the role of Christ in creating real value, and how Paul, being a good teacher, is going to show them that. All right, so... Um, So first, uh, we're going to come to uh, verse um, 14. But may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. For now on, let no one cause trouble for me, for I bear on my body the brand marks of Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be with your spirit, brethren. Amen. So first he says, um, I am dead to the world, and the world is dead to me. Um, in other words, he, is not, he does not live to please the world for his own sake, nor is he going to please the world for the world's sake. Why? Because there is no value in living for the world, and there is only value in living for Christ. Everything in the world fades. Everything in the world decays. That's part of the, the impact of sin upon this world. Yet Christ being eternal, everything that has its foundation that comes under the Lord or builds its foundation upon Jesus Christ, that has eternity built into it. Now, what's interesting is that while the old teachers were trying to protect themselves from the, from the persecution of others uh, for their sake or for the world's sake, this is the next point, Jesus ran towards persecution. He not only took the persecution of the world um, uh, because of his faithfulness to the Heavenly Father, but he even took the wrath of God so that I personally could avoid the wrath of God. I didn't need to please the world to avoid a worldly persecution. Jesus ran a persecution for me. Now, Jesus did that because I couldn't do it. And if I tried to do it, by how the world tells me to do it, it would be useless. It would be like trying to fight a war with water pistols against armored tanks. There's no value in living for the world. There's only value in living in Christ. Now, on our next point, these false teachers were boasting 
in the great numbers that were being circumcised so it could be a stamp on their resume as if it meant everything and carried value. But Paul states that the only, the only, the only thing he can boast on is in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. That work of the cross versus the work of circumcision. A thousand circumcisions is worth nothing compared to the sacrificial work of one Jesus Christ on the cross. And these false teachers acted as though circumcision could save Gentiles, but no, it couldn't. It could not assure anything for them. Only Jesus could. And circumcision wasn't going to save them. Only Jesus could do that. And finally, and this is an interesting point Paul makes here, he states that the false teachers, though in words that circumcision was important because of the old law, that their actions proved they did not care what circumcision was because they did not follow the law. Because on action, circumcision has been shown by these false teachers to mean nothing. And Paul actually agrees with them here. <laughs> he agrees. Based on their actions, circumcision means nothing. And he point blank says, circumcision means nothing in this text. So whether a person is circumcised or not means absolutely nothing in light of eternity and means absolutely nothing compared to the spiritual rebirth that happens in Jesus Christ. That is what Paul meant by a new creation. We fill our lives with all of these empty symbols, but we forget the reality. The truth of the matter is that anything we do living for the world has no value compared to the value in Jesus Christ. Now, the freedom of Jesus Christ can do more for you than anything you can do for yourself. Because anything motivated by worldly motivation, a fleshly motivation, or a selfish motivation dies away with the world it was built upon. And building upon what Christ has done on the cross, the persecution he took for us, that transformation and rebirth as a new creation he brings us to is found and built upon eternity and the perfect eternal one God, Jesus, Messiah. There is no value in living for the world without living in Christ in the world. There is not value in living for the world. There is only value living in Christ Jesus. So let's bring this message home. Let's take a look at it. As a church body, it is easy to get caught up by how the world wants us to operate. The greatest temptation is this, bigger numbers of attendance, better music, better performances, bigger budgets, more expansive programs. Now, these things sh should not be treated as an end in of themselves or things that we should boast in. There's a real likelihood that a megachurch in the Midwest will see fewer people come to a real saving faith than the small house church in China. What does God value in the work of his workers? Are we overly focused on numbers and symbols? Are we at, are we reacting to a trans, or are we reacting to a transformed life in Jesus Christ? I'm not saying that we back away from programs or music or small groups and uh, and that we should be upset when numbers get bigger in a church. Certainly not. But what I am saying is we need to make sure the motivations in the church and for us as individuals remains focused on the transforming work of Christ on the individuals in the church and on the church as a whole and not the empty evidence of doing something because it is big and cool. So, for me, when I was a young man in college, I'm going to pretend I'm still a young man. I'm going to hold on to that. I learned that being good meant nothing. And was worth nothing if not done genuinely and prayerfully in the name of Jesus. And the same was true in my suffering. That my suffering meant nothing and was worth nothing if not done genuinely and prayerfully in the name of Jesus. Why? Because everything that is done for the world has no value. 
The only value in anything is that which is done in Jesus Christ. So, what are we going to do with this now? I, I would like to say simple. One, it's time to prayerfully bring your actions to the Lord and give it to the Lord. We need to take a survey. Whether you're in formal ministry, a leader, a teacher, a prayer warrior, a volunteer, a crew hand, a cook, or someone that just even sits in the seat on Sundays during service, what you bring to your job, your hobbies, what do you bring to your God? I think we should take the next 10 minutes and this is what we're going to do. After service, take 10 or 15 minutes and pull out a piece of paper. And I want you to begin to write out all the things you do. Just off the top of your head, don't give yourself a chance to mull over it. Just start writing things down. What is it you do during the day? Okay, so start off with, uh, I wake up in the morning, I brush my teeth. I work as a business analyst, I flip burgers, I take care of my neighbor's dog, whatever. Write as many things as you can. Good, bad, ugly. Then next to that, I want you to write out the first thing that comes to your mind regarding its benefits. Who it benefits and how it benefits. So like a paycheck will be one of those, for many people, I work as a business analyst, I get a paycheck, I make money, I get food for it. Now, third column next to that, how is that benefiting the kingdom? How, is, how does that honor and glorify Jesus Christ? That paycheck, do I give joyfully in the Lord in that? Is there a ministry that I am bringing that to the Lord? As I watch my neighbor's dog, is there an opportunity to build a relationship that I can share the gospel with them? I want you to keep this exercise with you in your prayer time. And I want you to pray that what you do may bring some worldly blessing, but ultimately that you recognize where you should be motivated by the Lord in doing these things. Start with the kingdom purpose. And obviously, as you made a list, you may even identify some things that you can't see a way that God is glorified in that. And you've probably identified some sin in your life. Work on cutting that out. Because there is no value in living for the world unless we are living for Christ. And let's give the Lord our very best. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. God, that we can come together and honor you. And Lord, I would ask your forgiveness if at any time, Lord, I, I, I know I do this. We all do it, Lord. Where we react or we do something in, in hopes of saving ourselves to make ourselves look better, um, to build ourselves up for our own sakes as if we're building a kingdom here on earth, Lord, in our name. But Lord, we are not here for the world. You made us a new creation, Lord. You loved us when we didn't deserve it. And we want to honor you and your kingdom. Let us not give into the temptation, Lord, of believing in a false circumcision and believing that we can be saved by anything we do, but to rely completely, Lord, on you and your will. We thank you. And may we honor you in all that we say and do. We love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you.